today's webinar, uh, the basics of API testing using HP's unified functional testing. We're in for a great time today, I think. We've got over 150 people on this call, so it's going to be busy. Um, have your questions ready and uh, as we work through. So moving on to the next slide. So uh, this event is being hosted by um, myself. Um, I, I'm Stevan Shivanovic. Um, I've been in IT for now over 20 years. I'm a principal account director for a company called Infuse Consulting Limit, Limited, but I'm also uh, the UK chapter lead, Vivid chapter lead for the Agile Specialist Interest Group. So it's uh, a double interest here. Um, so over the past 20 years, I've been focused in on testing and automation, but also in how to use Agile uh, approaches to optimize testing and how to make it work. Um, and I'm currently running an integration testing project where conveniently we're using uh, the HP tool set um, which uh, underpins, uh, AL, which is underpinned by ALM and utilizing UFT and overlaying that we use an infused commercially available tool called Use Mango which provides an overall uh, framework and system to allow rapid automation. So I'm very keen to hear about today's, uh, uh, what today's speakers have to say. Uh, I think we're in for an exciting webinar as already mentioned. Uh, we're not just going to have slides, you'll be glad to hear. Um, we've got a great demo for you as well. So moving on to the next slide. So today's session. Um, we are very honored today to have uh, two people. Uh, the person that you'll be hearing the most is Joe Colantino, Colantonio. Uh, he describes himself as a test automation guru with over 14 years of experience successfully developing and implementing numerous software automation and performance testing solutions using vendor-based and open source test tools. He's the owner of a popular test automation blog. Uh, quick plug is www.joecoltino.com and is the host of Test Talks, uh, a podcast uh, dedicated to all things test automation. And he's the author of the UFT API Testing Manifesto, a step-by-step -step testing guide for the masses. Secondly, we've got Clint Sprove. Uh, who's the senior product manager from HP Software. Uh, he's senior product manager uh, for HP Functional Testing, uh, has been an independent consultant specializing in test management and test automation. Uh, he was previously director of product strategy for Ball and Solutions division of Microfocus, uh, where he created Ball and's mobile strategy for functional yeah, test automation. The didn't talk. Oh. Hi, is, uh, and uh, so I'll carry on, sorry, and uh, has over 20 years of experience in software development and quality assurance. Um, can we move on to the next uh, slide? A quick note about housekeeping. Uh, today's live session uh, is intended for all Vivit members. The recording will be posted in the webinar section on the Vivit website, so I'd encourage everybody to go onto the Vivit website. Uh, also, a quick plug the, to advise people to look on the Vivit website regularly, subscribe for messages there, have a look what's going on. There's an awful lot of good stuff on there. Um, it would probably take a couple of days for the slide sets to appear, but uh, they will be made available. Um, we will also make it um, available um, via an email link um, once it's posted on the Vivit website. So the important thing, and this is where it's important for everybody, is if you have questions, please ask them. Um, this talk is as much as uh, you as everybody else, and uh, the intent here is to get your points over as quickly as possible. So before I hand over to Joe, 
just one final slide, slide six. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and uh, ju just some information about webinar controls. Um, you should all be able to see this as part of joining the webinar. Um, to submit a question, this is the important one, uh, make sure that the questions pane is expanded. So you, you'll see a, a list of panes, select the questions one, and uh, then uh, click to send. So uh, I'll stop talking at this point. I'll pick up at the end when we talk about when we're asking questions, and I'll hand over to uh, Clint. Clint. All right. Thank you, Stefan. Well, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, I am very excited to be co-presenting this with Joe and presenting this to the Vivid community because I think this is a topic that um, is long overdue, not only for Vivid but for UFT users in general. So what we'd like to talk about and one of the reasons we are really excited to um, start this webinar is for an area of UFT that most of our uh, HP customers and users have been struggling with, and that's with API testing. So we're going to dive into that and really get a good understanding of why this is important. Uh, next slide, please. So let's look at the importance of API testing. So as you know, and most of you are probably experiencing this within your organization, is the, the need for faster application delivery, especially with the advent of various agile development methodologies. We're asked to deliver or actually test more within that time frame. So we, have, we actually have to shift less, meaning that we're bringing testing earlier in the life cycle. And part of this is API testing, which is extremely important. So what it's doing is actually causing some discomfort for some of the testers who are doing test automation, but they've been doing mostly UI testing. And having to test without a UI, even though they may understand coding concepts and be able to do test automation, testing uh, at the headless layer can be somewhat uh, a challenge for some of the uh, testers. So our goal with unified functional testing is to Okay, so our, our goal of, with unified functional testing is to ensure that our testers are able to keep up with the pace of development and be able to do the type of testing that's being asked of, of organizations now, especially as testers move into uh, scrum teams or doing uh, extreme programming type tasks. Uh, next slide, please. So what I'd like to do because of this change, I want to ask a couple of questions before we really get started. So the first poll question is, do you use the API and web services testing functionality of UFT? Okay, great. This is interesting poll results. I see that 73% of you on this uh, webinar uh, do not use the API and web services testing functionality of UFT, which is actually, that's actually pretty good for this webinar because you will definitely learn a lot. We see that 27% of you are actually using it. Um, if we can go to the next poll question, now, do you believe that API testing is difficult? All right, so we have the results from this poll. 43% uh, of you are not sure, which makes sense since most of you, 73% of you, don't actually use the API testing functionality. So I believe, based upon this poll, it's really reflecting exactly what I've seen when I've, when I've visited with various customers and HP uh, QTP and UFT power users. So thank you for participating uh, in these polls. Um, this will really help us guide the webinar so that you really get um, great information and really learn a lot from Joe. So we're really glad to have him aboard. So with that said, we go ahead and pass the um, uh, pass the baton on to Joe. And uh, Joe, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Clint. Thanks, Clint. So I just want to go over a few slides and then jump into a hands-on demo. I only have about four slides, so it shouldn't take so, uh, too long before we get into the demo. So I am Joe um, from JoeColantonio.com. And so today I just want to go over the basics of API testing using HP's UFT API. So I've been involved in test automation for almost 15 years. And in the beginning, pretty much every type of test automation that I performed was against a GUI user interface. 
you know, whether it was a, a thick client application, a browser, and even back in the day, green screens for mainframes. But now, my time is pretty much split 50-50 between UI and 50% against API testing. And I think there's a few reasons for that, and I think I'm not the only one. I think there's a big change going on in the industry, uh, one of them being the agile practices that companies have been adopting, and also the second thing is the Internet of Things. So, you know, with agile development becoming the standard in most organizations, the ways in which we develop software and automate tests has changed dramatically. You know, GUI tests that go against the UI tend to take a long time to run. And so when you're doing agile practices like continuous integration, where someone's doing a build and they need to get feedback quickly whether or not they broke the build, you know, having a 100% a GUI regression test suite just takes too long and it doesn't give you the feedback in the amount of time you really need it. And also, if you're doing agile, a lot of times you'll be doing two to three week sprints and that's such a short amount of time that, you know, sometimes it, it, we don't have enough time to run all our GUI automation tests because maybe the suite takes, you know, a whole week to run or, or it takes a very long time. So you know, what the problem is basically is we need tests that run quickly um, and tests that can give quicker feedback and also will help you not only to test the new development you're doing within your sprints but also to do some regression tests after that and be able to do it fairly quickly so that you're not spending a long amount of time just doing regression tests. So I think most people may have seen this slide already, but it's basically from Mike Cohen. And basically the image represents the opposite of the way most non-agile development teams perform automated tests. So back in the day, pretty much everything was just a GUI test. I still have teams that work against uh, you know, older legacy applications, and they have basically hardly any unit tests. Well, with Agile, that's been changed. I think the, the better practice now is that the majority of your tests that make up the bulk of your test suite should be unit tests. And so these unit tests are at a very small level, at a method level. They're usually written in the same language that a developer writes, so they should be able to write them fairly quickly. And they run very, very fast. So if you're running in a CI like Jenkins or Electric Commander, these tests should run super quick and give you super feedback. I notice at the top, the UI, this is the smallest piece of this, of this pyramid. And this is the opposite of probably what most people are familiar with. And so really the sweet spot is this service layer, this middle layer. And this middle layer really represents headless testing, uh, API testing. And it could be you know, Java. Uh, it could be JMS. It could be uh, web services, REST services, HTTP. You know, anything that's headless. And, and the reason for this is mostly if you've been doing GUI automation for any amount of time, you know that automation is a big effort to keep current and to maintain. And that GUI automation, just honestly, it takes a long time. But with API tests, because they're headless, they tend to run much quicker and have much less overhead. And, and I'll be honest with you, most, most API tests, are, I think, is a lot easier to, to create than a UI test. So the second piece that I think is really going to take off in the, in the coming years is the Internet of Things. Now, this is a pretty big buzzword, but the Internet of Things basically is everyday objects that have embedded functionality that allows them to talk over the web using HTTP to communicate with a remote back end. So basically, you know, more and more things will have sensors embedded into them. Now, just the other day, day, I was watching a TV show, and I saw something about a medication cap that keeps track of you know, when to take your medicine and when you're running low. So that's a type of Internet of Things type of object that actually has an embedded sensor in it. So extend this trend outward. I've seen estimates that in 2020, there's going to be over 50 billion objects that connect to the Internet. So how are we going to test these things? So how do you test the scale that me measures your, your weight and fat and then tweets it out, and then it's some sort of gamification that goes out to a remote server and, and, it, and it compares it against maybe your five uh, top friends that you're competing against? or a refrigerator that keeps track that you're running low on milk and it alerts you to that. Or even, this sounds sci-fi, but you know, biosensors embedded into your clothing that can tell your stress level and adjust your environment around you based on that information. So none of these examples have a traditional user interface. So how do we test them? So first, I just want to look at what we're talking about when I say API headless testing. So in this example, I have an internet scale. And this scale basically consumes a web service that resides on a remote server. So to communicate to it, it usually uses HTTP to make a request to that service. 
and it sends some information like the weight or body fat. And then that remote server takes that information, performs some sort of calculations, and it sends a response back, and it's usually in a JSON or XML format, to the client. So how do we mimic this type of, this type of interaction? So how do we test APIs? So one way we can test APIs, and one of, the, one of the better solutions out there, I think, is using HP's unified functional testing with their API test type. So it really can help you test all kinds of headless technologies. When I started about two years ago testing web services, I was looking around for a solution that can help me. And most of our GUI tests were written in QTP. And I realized that HP had a product called uh, Service Test. And so as I was learning service tests, I documented everything I learned. And during that time, they came out with a new product called Unified Functional Testing. And basically, that took both QTP and service tests, and it brought them and merged them into one user interface. And so based on that learning that I learned basically from that, I, I documented all this information. I posted it and created a resource called the UFT API Testing Manifesto. So if you're like me, you probably think slides are boring. And so I just want to jump right into the hands-on demo. And basically, it's going to be three things I'm going to cover. The first one is I want to show how to test a web service and also how to data drive that service. And then I want to show how you can pass data between different activities within your test flow. And then I want to show how to test a REST service. So I'm just going to just jump right in and get to it. Whilst we're switching slides, I'd like to come in at this point and just encourage people to ask questions. Um, I, I, the more questions that get asked, the more personal we can make this for you and, and the more informative. So uh, please ask questions. Over to you, Absolutely. Joe. Thank you. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, starting with HP uh, Unified Testing 11.5, HP has unified both, they've taken both QTP and API testing, and they've merged it into one IDE. So they have the same type of flow, the same IDE, where you can now create both GUI tests and API tests. So when you go to File New, you now have an option for test. And this test will include a GUI test and API test. And one of the questions I get asked all the time is, where is QTP? Well, since 11.5, there is no longer a product called QTP. It's now Unified Functional Testing. And what used to be QTP is now a GUI test. And what used to be called Service Test is an API test. And just so you know, if you're using API tests, you can also test things like business testing. And with the API test, you can also consume API tests within Load Runner. So I just want to create a simple example now and just show us the UI to get us familiar with what the uh, terrain looks like before we actually go into testing something. So basically, within unified functional testing, within the API piece, there are really four main sections you just need to be aware of. On the left-hand side, we have this toolbox. And this is where all the activities, all the things you can do to perform a test against an API are located. And then you drag these activities onto this middle area. This is the canvas area. And this is where you create your test flow. So this is where you can truly create an end-to-end -end test. You could create a, an API test that has an activity that makes a call to an API, gets a response back, and then sends that request to, say, a GUI test that will call uh, a GUI automation test and will kick that off and start a browser. And you can link all these things up into different kind of configurations. It's really configurable and really customizable. And once you have an activity on your Canvas area, the test flow, all activities have properties. So the other area you want to look for is on the right-hand side, which is a property. And then the last piece is this bottom area. And this bottom area basically shows, uh, it has multiple tabs. The main things are really the output that you'll see what happens when you send an API. It'll show all the information that's being sent back and forth between the service to a remote uh, service and, and, and back. And also, this is where you would see any errors that may occur. And uh, if you data, have a test that's data-driven, this is where you would data drive your test and where your data sheets would be located. So to actually see this in action, I'm just going to import a WSDL and start working with a, with a web service. Now, this web service is available. It's called Geo IP Service. And basically, you pass it an IP address. And based on that information, it will bring back where that particular computer is located. So anytime you import something into UFT API, it brings it into your toolbox area on the left-hand side. So you notice now under my local activities, I now have a web service section. And if I expand this, I can see the web service that I just read in from the WSDL. And it, 
based on that, I now see the operations that I can perform based on that WSDL that I just brought in for that web service. So I'm going to drag in this get GeoIP. Now this is what we call an activity. Any of these items, like I said, within this toolbox area are called activities. So I brought this operation into the, the main test flow. And I'm going to click on the get GeoIP. And notice because UFT API is intelligent enough to read the web, the WSDL, the WSDL is basically a contract between the web service and, and the client and knows already the inputs and outputs that are required for you. So you don't have to do anything. You automatically know, hey, I see my inputs. There's one input, and I see my output. And also what's really neat about UFT API, it gives you visual indicators within the canvas to show you uh, different information. So over here you can see it has a 2 next to it. If I click on this 2, it'll show you that it has a 2 input, any and IP address, and it has three outputs. So you can close these. And as you see, as we connect, uh, create more and more complex tests, uh, this will fill up with these different kinds of visual indicators that are really helpful as you're creating tests. So right now, I'm just going to pass this uh, a valid IP address and just take a look at what the results look like. So I'm just going to run this test. This test, you would run it just like you would a normal uh, GUI test, or if you're familiar with QTP, the same way. Uh, it also uh, connects with ALM just like QTP used to connect with, and you can pass the parameters. But right now, I'm just going to run it vanilla out of the box and just pass it this IP address and look at the results. And basically, what's happening is UFT is making a call out to that remote server. It's sending that request out to the remote server, and then it's getting a response back from that remote server. So if we expand the HP Run Result Viewer, which if you're familiar with QTP, it's the same result viewer. And we look at, if we expand all, and then look at this Get Geo IP, it'll show you underneath the captured data all the types of information that was used to make that request. And it also shows you the response that was sent back from the service. So say you want to know all the values that were returned to you, this is where you could look. But notice sometimes if you had a complex response, it could be hard to read because you have to scroll up and down. So sometimes people don't realize there's some links for request and response that if you click on these links, it'll bring it up in an individual browser and it really makes it a lot easier to read. So if you have a response that's bringing back 50 elements, you, know, you probably want to look at, at it in this view. So notice one of the things returned is country name, China. So most, like any other test, I want to verify that the response I'm getting back from that service is correct. And so you would perform something called a checkpoint. And checkpoints are a way you would validate any sort of API response. And these checkpoints are very, very flexible. So right now, I'm just going to expand underneath this property section underneath checkpoints. Notice, like I said, UFT already shows me what it expects to be returned. And one of those values is country name. So I'm going to click on validate, and I'm going to do equal China. Now this is a very simple checkpoint. But like I said, it's very flexible. If you click on this down arrow next to China, you could do an equal, doesn't equal, greater than, less than, starts with, end, ends with, contains. You can do a regex expression. And if it's XML, you can even do an XPath expression. So if you had a very complex uh, XML that's being returned to you and you really need to drill down onto those nodes, you can create uh, an, an actual XPath that will do the checkpoint for you if the ones out of the box don't meet your needs. So let's just run this really quick and just see what this looks like. So I'm going to run it. This time it's going to do the same thing. It's going to make a request out to the service, get a response back. And basically when it gets that response, it's going to validate that that country name element does contain China. So that's how it's going to perform the checkpoint and let us know whether or not the response that we got back, the request we got back, really was what we expected. So another point I want to get through is that you can have as many, many web services, as many API tests within this workflow as possible. So if you drag these onto your main canvas area, they could talk to one another and pass values back and forth between them. And uh, we'll see that right after this example. And I'm on a really slow connection right now, so that's why there's some delay here. They say never do a live demo to have everything recorded, so hopefully this should be fine, though. So I apologize. I was able to do this fine this morning, of course, and now I'm not sure what's occurring. So I apologize. Like I said, this was working fine earlier, but just let me start it over again. I think I'm running some other application that's throwing it off. Also, be aware that a lot of times UFT uh, 
HP comes out with a lot of patches, a lot of patch updates, so you probably want to always get the latest result, the latest patch, and I don't think I have the latest patch version. I have 12.1, but I think they came out with another patch recently. So just something to be aware of. All right, so I'm just going to go back over here and start a new test, and let's import that whistle one more time. Also notice it keeps a history of your last uh, whistles that you've interacted with, so I don't have to type anything in, it's already there. And I'm just going to drag that operation onto the Canvas area one more time and add that IP address. And I'm just going to add the country name China. And let's run the test again. Actually, let me save it first. And now let's run it. OK, so if we look at the response again, if we expand this out by expand all, we go to this checkpoint, it'll show you now the value that I expected and what was actually returned from it. So this is a pretty vanilla checkpoint, but you could do all kinds of complex checkpoints like I mentioned earlier. But another great feature about UFT API is how quickly you can data drive a test. So say we have like 50 IP addresses that we needed to validate. So all we need to do then is under properties, anytime an activity can be data driven, it will have this icon, this data drive entire step. So if I click on this step, it brings up the data drive window and you can either select an Excel sheet or an XML file to data drive it. And I'm just going to do both input and checkpoints and let it configure a for loop for me. So basically it's going to loop through every record that I add to my, my input properties. So right now, notice it automatically created some data sheets for me. The first one is the input data sheet, and the second one is the actual checkpoint. So I'm just going to go in and add some values really quickly and run this to show you how quickly you can create a data-driven test within UFT API. And for my return code, I know all of them are 1, so I'm going to add a 1. And I know the second one is going to be United States, so I'm going to do United States. And I know the last one is Egypt. And run the test now. So one thing to be aware of, like I said, you can view the results under this test view, but also in UFT API it has this output view, which also shows you the same exact results and may be more readable if you're debugging. So if we look at the results within the viewer and we expand this test flow again, you'll notice it now has three iterations and three checkpoints. And notice that it iterated each record within my data sheet and was able to validate uh, a response back with the, that piece of el that element response. So that's how quickly you can data drive a test. Uh, it's really cool and it, and it works fairly quickly. So another feature to be aware of is how you can pass data between activities on your in your test flow. So in this example, I want to just bring on, I want to create a report and tell the report, hi, I'm from, and tell the country I'm, for, I'm from. So if you look under this toolbox here, you'll notice there's a miscellaneous activity and there's a string manipulation activity. So I'm going to bring on this concatenation string activity, and this allows you basically to cut and paste two strings together. So this in, in this prefix, I'm going to write, hi, I'm from. And then for the suffix, Anytime you work with an activity, for a value, if you see to the right of it, there should be a link called link to data source. This allows you to point to any previous step within your test flow. So you can reuse, you can make a request to, an, uh, say, a web service, and then use that response back. So right here, I'm going to point to the get GOIP web service. And under, I could point to any of these values, but I just want to point to the return code name that's going to be sent to me. And then now, I just want to drag on a report message. And I want to say that this passes. And once again, I'm going to point to a previous value. So I'm going to click on that data link for, for the message value. And now I'm going to point to this concatenation string's results. So basically, this concatenation string is going to say, hi, I'm from. It's going to grab a return value for the get GOIP country name. And it's going to say the name of the country. So let's run this really quick and see what the results look like.
So if we expand this out again, you'll notice now we have a report message step. And notice now it has, look how cool that is. Hi, I'm from in the name of the country. It automatically appends it to it. So once again, this is a quick trivial example, but I just wanted to demonstrate that you could connect multiple activities together and pass data back and forth between them. And on the, on the uh, canvas area itself, it shows you when there's a relationship between an activity. So you could do all kinds of activities. You could test, um, you could do um, Java network testing, J, um, SAP testing, MQ testing. So it's very flexible that way. So I know I'm running low on time, but I really want to show one of the biggest benefits, I think, of uh, UFT API. And that is, if you use QTP in the past, you know that its programming language is, Q is uh, Visual Basic. But with UFT API, you get to use C Sharp. So if, there's not, if it's out of the box, it doesn't give you the functionality you need, pretty much every activity allows you to create custom code for it. And if it doesn't have an act, uh, a way to create custom code, it has, a, a, under miscellaneous, a custom code activity that you could drag onto your, your Canvas area and create yourself. So I just want to show really quickly how easy this is to use. So if I click on any of these activities, notice there's a Thunderbolt. So if you click on this, it gives you where you want to run your custom activity from. So I'm just going to choose after the request was processed. And I'm going to create a default handler. So if you're, vi if you're familiar with Visual Studio, this should look pretty familiar to you. It has the same IntelliSense type feel to it. And if you had a book on C Sharp, you could pretty much write straight C Sharp in here and be able to to perform pretty much all the activities you normally could within Visual Studio. Now, this isn't Visual Studio, but it has the same types of functionality and it's the same visual uh, C Sharp that you would use. So if you click on a dot, you notice it has the same IntelliSense. So in this example, you know, I just wanted to show really quick how we can grab some code at runtime and write it out to that report message that we created earlier. So basically what I want to do is just write out, say, I want to write the, write the results of where this API test is saved to. So I'm going to collect a local storage path, and I'm going to create a variable called my path. Now this is C-sharp syntax. So if you're familiar with C-sharp, it's the same syntax. So this is going to grab the local path of where this current API test is found. And I'm just going to write out to the report message I have on my canvas. So notice I have a report message. This is the one, if I went to the canvas area, that's what the name would be. I'm going to do a dot. And notice it has a message method. So I'm going to make that equal my path. So let's run this really quick. Whoop. Need to end it with the semicolon. All right, now let me run this and show you what the output looks like. All right, so let's expand the results and see what, what happened. So if we look at our report message now, I overwrote what was previously written by the API, and now I'm writing, using custom code, this path of where this is located. And now, like, once again, this is a trivial example, but this is awesome. This makes UFT API very flexible. If you can't do something out of the box, most likely you can figure it out with the using custom code technology, which is really neat. So I'm just going to close this now, and the next example I want to go over is a REST test. So I'm just doing a new test. And for REST tests, I'm going to use a Google API for a Google Books. So I'm going to search Google Books for a certain term. So if you go to Google Developers, this is the API I'm using. It's a Google Books API family. And basically, I'm going to use a REST service for the GET request. And I'm going to pass it a query with the term that I want to look for. So there's the information that I'm going to be passing to it. So I'm going to click on this Add REST Service. 
And basically, this allows you to model a REST service. You only do, need to do this once. So if you use a REST service multiple times, you could save it local to your machine or ALM. And so you won't have to do this every time you need to interact with the service. It's just a one-time thing. So now I'm going to add a resource. I happen to know by the documentation the name of the resource is called Volume. And this is trivial. It could be whatever you want to name it, but I want to keep it consistent. And then I'm going to add a method. And this is all based on the documentation I was reading on the API, how I know what to call. And this is going to be Query. And now, basically, I'm just going to now pass it. Ah, I forgot to copy and paste it. Sorry, let me go back. So basically, all this is going to do is make a request, and now it's going to pass the, this uh, query parameter. And I'm going to pass it touring. And if you run the test here, it will return back the re response back from the service, and it will show you all the information that was turned back from the uh, service. So that's how easy it is to do a REST service. You usually just need to pass a bunch of parameters, and it returns back a, re a response. And our response, typically, what I've been seeing normally recently is uh, it returns it back in JSON. The JSON is, bunch, is basically just a bunch of key value pairs. So this is just the key total items and the value that it contains. And so if you click on OK, this will import it into your toolbox area, just like it does a web service. And like I said, if you right click on this service, you can move to either save it locally on your machine or save it in LM. And you can reuse it in multiple tests. So if I was to save this locally and I were to start a new test, this would already be in there underneath my local activities area. So I'm going to just drag this query on my main canvas area. And what I really wanted to show you was how easy it is to do testing if you have a, a response that's returning it back, say, 50 elements. So I'm just going to run this one more time. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this HTTP input checkpoint section. Under the HTTP tab. Under here, there's an option for response body. I'm going to change it to JSON. And there's this cool icon called load from replay. So HP, UFT API, remembers the response that was sent back to you already. So I'm just going to load that up. And I need to run it first in my Canvas area so it finds that. going to close the results, go back to the HTTP, and now I'm going to load it one more time. And so HTTP knows what the response was, and it's going to automatically read that in now for you automatically. So if you had a checkpoint, so you needed to check every single value returned to you from that response, by just running it once and just doing that load from um, this load activity, you can now automatically checkpoint, check all these different elements within your test. So if I run this, I believe it's about 400 uh, elements that it's going to validate for us automatically. So you can see right here it has 555 elements that it that it fixed that that it recognized and that we had checkpoints for. So if we look at the results, we look at checkpoints. We see all the checkpoints and all the values. Now I know we're running out of time. That's it for my demo. I know I went really quick, so if you have any messages, if you want to ping me later, feel free to. But there's a lot, a lot of functionality within UFT API that allows you to do all types of API testing. And those are just a few examples of how flexible it is and how it can help you rapidly create API tests. So I believe we have question and answers. Yeah. Joe, thank you very much for that. That was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, we've had quite a few questions coming in as uh, as we've uh, been talking and uh, some good feedback. Um, the first question for you, Joe. Um, my testers use BPT and UFT for UI testing. Can we implement BPT with API and web services testing? Absolutely. 
Yep, it's the same exact process that you would follow when you're doing QTP. So you can create them either in ALM directly or within the tool itself. You can uh, convert an, uh, an API test to a BBT test. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that. Um, if anybody, by the way, has any more questions as they're thinking about it, uh, please post away um, or we'll uh, look to answering them later. So um, let's have a look at the next one. Uh, uh, so from John, can you expand on your comments about using an API test in LoadRunner? Sure. So. I have a section in my book that I'm writing here in the update, which has a performance area. So basically, you can use transactions around your API test. So there's a start transaction and an end transaction within UFT API that you can wrap around your service. And then you can just run this within the controller, and it will keep track of how long it took for that request to take. And you just basically add it to Load Runner, just like you would a normal a VU gen type of script, and you can run it within the controller just like you normally would with uh, any other UF, any other UFT, no, any other load runner uh, protocol. Excellent. Got some useful diagrams in there as well. So thank you for that, Joe. Um, okay, let's uh, let's go to the next question. Um, I believe you can also drive data using a query to a database from Christopher. Yep, so there's database activities. So if you go into UFT, uh, under this toolbox, there's a database. And the database, you can basically open a connection. You can uh, select data by doing, or execute data by doing a, a, you know, whatever the, your SQL statement is. And then just like the other activities, you can use that output as input within your properties. So you can, uh, it does have database activities that does allow you to do that type of uh, functionality. And it's as simple as drag and drop as necessary. Well, you know, sometimes it's not as always as drag and drop, but yeah, typically, uh, if, you're, if you're lucky, just drag and drop is good enough. It should be able to be enough to, to, to get that functionality. Okay. Um, we've also had a question from John, which was exactly the same, so I'm not uh, on the same theme. Um, Next one from uh, Wilson. Uh, can UFT handle HTML5 web sockets? Ooh. I, I haven't tried it. I don't think so. I think that's more, well, I have to check. I, I, I honestly can't tell you. I don't think it does, but I can't honestly say 100% that it does or doesn't. Um, I, I'd have to uh, try it with the latest version. It does have an, an HTTP uh, activity for a request and a re receiver. So I'm just not sure on that. Okay. Maybe Clint, you can make a, a, a note of that and we could look and find out, get back to them. Yes, definitely. Awesome. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much, Clint. So um, moving on, uh, we're still getting some questions coming in, which is good. Please keep raising those questions. Um, can I use, it's a short question from Paul, can I use the existing repository? Uh, the existing I'm repository? So this is a GUI test, I assume, because of repository. Um, I believe so, it's the same, it's the same tool, it's been rebranded. I may be, I just, Clint, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically QTP has just been rebranded as Unified Functional Testing and that the previous uh, functionality should still be the, exactly the same within unified functionality testing, but with some extra um, extra things that can help you. Right, that, that is correct. So migrating from QTP to UFT is really uh, is fairly painless because it really is a, the, the exact same product. And the reason it was, and uh, you had mentioned this earlier, the combination or the, the unification of the API testing from service tests with the, uh, the functionality of QTP. So you still have the same functionality that you had in, in QTP within UFT, and then some. OK. Uh, Joe, anything you want to add to that? No, I definitely agree. It's basically what used to be, I know sometimes it's hard to get your, your mind around. People are so used to saying QTP. If you go to File New, 
And that GUI test is basically your standard QTP test. So if you're familiar with QTP, it should be fairly painless for you to get back up to speed. It's, it's the same thing, but it's just been rebranded, just renamed, basically. That's how I put it. Okay. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, Joe, it's a rapid fire round for you here. There's, <laughs> there's lots here. Uh, so Elizabeth, from Elizabeth, uh, will Joe recommend any books for beginners? Well, I'd recommend my book. But um, I don't, honestly, because I don't know of any other books. This is available on Amazon. I am working on a second edition that's going to be available in a few weeks. Um, but right now you can still get this on Amazon, and uh, I'm working on a new edition. I, I'm not, you know, there are, in, in my book I do have um, certain resources you can go to other books that, not, that aren't specific to UFT API, but will uh, go into more detail of maybe what an API test is, maybe using a, what is REST. So you can just learn maybe the terminology and the, and the uh, architecture behind it would help you be able to test them better. So there, there are a bunch of resources out there that aren't UFT API specific um, that could help you learn the technology. But this is the only book I'm aware of that's available now for exactly for UFT API testing. OK. No, that's, that's really handy. OK. Um, So let's uh, pick another one. Um, so there's one from uh, Ram uh, about, I saw uh, why they changed the name from QTP to uh, Unified. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Chris, is well, there anything you can add to that? I'm sorry, repeat the, which question was that one again? Okay, so there's a question from Ram uh, saying, I saw why they changed name from QTP to Unified. Thanks. Oh, okay, why they changed from QTP to uh, Unified. Well, just to give you <laughs> a little bit of background, and we people, customers have been asking us that for the past couple of years now. So it's really about us giving the products names in, in, in terms of their actual functionality. Uh, we were trying to get away from some of the more um, kind of, you know, cute names, I guess you could say, and we we're trying to define our products that were, they were very easy to understand. Of course, it's been tough for a lot of customers since UTP, excuse me, QTP is a uh, very well-known brand name that everyone knows uh, and loves. So uh, that, that's part of the reason uh, behind that, while you'll see uh, UFT, versus um, QTP in terms of the, uh, the actual product name. And you'll see that along the lines of some of our other products like service virtualization, network virtualization, and so forth. OK. Hopefully, Ram, that's answered your question there. Um, so move next, um, can we use the scripts to do load testing from Mark? Yes. So when you go into UFT API and you do File New, there is an option for tests. And there's an option for API load test. And unlike a GUI test, that you could use a GUI test within Load Runner, but you can only run one instance. Because this is headless, you can run multiple instances. But you know, I'm not sure what the overhead is. You may be better off using an HTTP straight out within Load Runner um, API SOAP uh, vUser. You probably would get more, more vUsers per machine, less overhead. But you can uh, leverage your tests already within API and make them load tests and, and just use those within load runner as well. So yes. OK. Um, thank you for that, Joe. So now uh, the next person is going to test my uh, mispronunciation of their name. <laughs> I believe it's something for you, uh, Yoyana. I hope, uh, I hope that's near enough. Uh, she asked, uh, can I import a ready a ready XML request directly. If the WIS still has a custom name space, will UFD still accept this XML request? So I guess it depends. I'd have to see the service. If you drag it onto the activity area, um, there's a grid view that can allow you to change the information. Uh, let me bring in a, let me show you.
So, you know, I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to see it. But basically, if you need to modify it in any way, uh, notice it, it tries to read in what it thinks it should be. But if you go to, it's in grid view. If you go to text view, uh, you can modify this to point to maybe what your namespace is, what the correct one is. Or you could try just using you know, one of the network uh, requests and, and, and using it that way. So I guess my answer is I don't know, but um, I'd, have to, I'd have to mess around with it, and I'm sure there'd be a way to get around it. Uh, if not, um, you could always contact HP um, support and see if they have any, any info on it. But I, I don't have any examples on how to do that. OK. Um, so before we carry on with any more questions, I'm just mindful of the time. Um, and that we were due to finish in uh, four minutes. We've still got a few more questions, so if people wish to stay on, a, I'm, I'm sure we can carry on for a few more minutes. Are you all right with that, Joe? Absolutely. Perfect. Uh, but before we do that, and uh, if you could switch to the slide set, so for those people that do need to finish, there's just a couple of little housekeeping bits that um, I'd like to just cover, and then we'll go back to the Q&A. So uh, if, if you've got time, please hold on. Um, so uh, a couple of quick notices for people, just to say that um, you know there, there is more information available. Um, there's some links in the slide set to the uh, IT experts community. Uh, HP has a very large community of support. It's a tool that is well used globally. Uh, so uh, please uh, look at the uh, community sites. And there's some online expert days coming up, which I thoroughly recommend. Have a look at them and uh, look to participate. Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, there's a couple of other things coming up soon. Um, there's Star West. Uh, that's an excellent uh, testing community um, so, uh, conference. Very well attended. Have some fantastic speakers on there uh, uh, on the 13th of October. Um, please go ahead, register, meet Vivid at the at the event. Um, there's a mobility virtual summit happening on October the 8th. Um, again, please follow the link. Have a look. Um, there's some um, there's some interesting things going on there. And then finally, but by no means least, there's HP Discover in Barcelona. Uh, this is a huge event by uh, HP. Uh, lots of people there, fantastic opportunity to meet other HP users, get to know what's happening with um, tools, with the software, um, a fantastic opportunity. Vivit will be there with a stand, so uh, please come and say hello. And if we move on to the final slide. Yes, yeah, I was then, gonna on, the, uh, on the Star West event. Um, for yeah. those of you that are attending the Star West conference, this is going to be on the Monday before the conference, um, and you can register to win an HP Chromebook. Uh, there will be uh, food and beverages served um, at that event, and it's for Vivid and non-Vivid members as well. So if you are going to attend Star West, and you'll be there that Monday evening from 4.30 to 7.30, um, please come along, bring a friend or bring several friends, and we, uh, we definitely would uh, love to have you and host you. Thanks for fantastic. Time. Thank, perfect. Thank you for that. Um, and then um, on the closure of this, um, when you come to finish, please fill in the short survey. <clears throat> it's really important for us to get the sort of feedback from yourselves. Uh, it's useful for both Vivit and HP. There's in, and so please take the time to complete that. Um, and also, um, if you do so, then uh, there's an opt-in for more info and opt-in for more info from HP. You'll be entered into a draw for uh, Joe's book, which I think is an excellent offer there as well. Just a little bit of an encouragement. So uh, at, at the top of the hours, thank you very much for everybody. We'll return back to the Q&As. For those people that uh, have to leave, thank you very, very much for your time today. Okay, so uh, Joe, are you ready to answer some more questions? Yes.
Okay, so let's uh, let's have a look. So next, uh, I think we've already answered this one, but I'm, I'm not sure if we want to cover it quick briefly again from Banu. Uh, thank you. Can you show a DB connection example? I mean, I don't know if I have time to. I don't have a, a database on this this machine here. Uh, let me look. You know, I, I don't have this working on my machine right now. This is a, my uh, demo machine. I don't have this yeah. installed, but in my book, I have an example of how to how to set up a database and how to connect to the database. And basically, um, using a SQL statement, how to create a DSN to connect to it. And I'm using MySQL for it. And you drag on the data, the database activity, and as a connection string. And basically, with that connection string, you can either uh, you could point to an existing ODBC connection, and then so I, you go ahead on your on your machine and set up an ODBC connection to your database, and then you could point uh, this connection uh, activity to it, and then you can run a SQL statement from it, and that's that's a, a really quick example of how to, how to run a, a database. Like I said, I don't have it, um, this in, this stuff running on my machine right now. Okay. But thank you for uh, taking us through some of the ideas behind that. And uh, so it certainly it looks achievable. It's we just don't have an opportunity in this demo. Exactly. Right. Um, so let's try. Um, I think again, similar request from uh, Paul uh, around. Can the object repository be used for API testing? Uh, no, I, I I'd have to say once again I'm not 100. percent I'd say no because an object repository is more for uh, GUI objects or a, a field element object. What what you can do is if you have services used all the time, like I work for a company that does healthcare, and so we have a patient rest service that goes based on J Joe Smith. It goes out and gets the MRN, which is a unique identifier for that patient. So we use that for all our test flows. So if we want to look at an exams, we need to know the ID. We always use that patient ID REST service. So we basically just move this and save it to ALM. So if someone else is creating a new test, they can just go and grab that previous test they already created that gets that information. So that's one way you can reuse it. It's kind of like an object repository. Um, it already has uh, predefined uh, fields and things already uh, saved for you. That's about the closest example I can think of that, that matches to that concept. Okay. That's great. Um, a bit of a tangential question here from David. He's asking, uh, when will UFT support Chromium Embedded Framework? It's all yours, Clint. <laughs> sure. Um, let me, I can check with our R&D team on that. Um, I'm not 100% sure in terms of where that is uh, on the roadmap, but um, we can definitely look into that. So we, we have your information, and I can definitely flag and make sure to follow up with you on that question. Excellent. Thanks, Clint. Okay, so the next two questions we've got are uh, both related to the sort of load testing aspects. Uh, so the first one is: uh, Do we need a link? Do we need to link ro load runner for API load testing using UFT? Mm, I'm sorry. Can we repeat that question one more time? Yes, of course. Sorry, I appreciate that wasn't clear. Uh, do we need a to link load runner for API load testing using UFT? Um. So, so when it, we create an API load test, do we need to link in uh, Load Runner or? Oh, I'm sorry. So no. Well, what you need to do is, if you want to use it uh, for an API for a load test, underneath Toolbox, there's a activity called Load Testing, and if we expand Load Testing, it shows you all the activities you can use. So you could add your start transactions around whatever uh, transaction you're trying to get times for. And then you save it, 
and then once you save it, and I, I don't have a load run a license on this machine, but in the controller, you just then point to this machine, and, and it'll be able to read the start and end transactions that you have wrapped around your IP, um, your IP test. Okay. All right, and the final question, and I think we'll be looking to close after this, um, is how how do you get the API load test to show up? Uh, I don't see it when I open up UFT. Yeah, so like all the HP products, you need a license for that. So there are separate licenses. So because I have a valid, I think I have a valid load runner controller license, and that's why it, it knows automatically what activities I can perform based on my license that, that I have. I'm pointing to a licensing server, so it knows already what, what I can perform. And that's why all these become available. I think this is based on what your current license is. I might be wrong, but Clint, correct you if I'm wrong, but if you had a license for it, it would show up. Yes, that's correct. Esteban, just really quick, uh, the previous question about how to use uh, API testing with the database, I do have a, yeah. a, a video on YouTube that shows it using Service Test 11.10, but it's the that same thing basically. So it shows you how to do a new database connection, and uh, so I can send that link out to the person who asked the question, or they can contact me directly, and I can send them other information if they need it. Fantastic, and I think that's a lovely point to finish off the, uh, this webinar um, with. If you know, clearly we've got lots of questions. We've answered quite a few. Um, any more questions? Please continue to feed in. Um, we'll look to collate and feed back on all of this over the next few days. Um, as, you, as people have registered on this, they will get a link to the slides as well. Um, and I think all it remains is to say a very, very big thank you, Joe and Clint. Uh, brilliant webinar. Uh, thank you for your time. And thank you, everybody, uh, for listening. Um, the activity on the um, questions board has been brilliant. So a big thank you to everybody as well.